I was then put into a position. Do I be honest with them? Tell them what I know? Or do I hide it from them? Hello, everyone. Welcome to Visionaries. If you're new here, this is our twice weekly live show uh, with some of the most influential and powerful people in gaming, internet culture, new media, and basically anything that uh, sort of younger people are into. We're we're an internet culture show that I co-host twice a week, uh, produced by my company Overcome, and we thank you for being here. Um, Today, we're going to be talking with Alan Benet, the former CEO of Panda Global. During this conversation, we're going to be talking about Alan's involvement um, in the company that he was previously the CEO of, Panda, and their Panda Cup, uh, which was a Super Smash Brothers circuit ran last year um, in December, late November, early December, Alan was accused of more or less being anti-competitive um, against another Smash Super Smash Brothers circuit called the Smash World Tour, which was a competing circuit. Um, the difference between the two, for those unfamiliar, is that Alan had a license to operate his tournament from Nintendo, who are the creators of Super Smash Brothers, and the Smash World Tour did not. And the after a discussion with Nintendo uh, prior to or throughout all of 2022, which culminated the week of Thanksgiving, the Smash World Tour more or less got the impression that if they ran their finale event in December, that they would be shut down by Nintendo, who has a history of doing such. Um, Alan was then written about and talked about by the Smash World Tourma Tournament organizers, other people in the community, and then also responded in kind in a blog post in December. Um, the, ultimately, because of all the issues, the Panda Cup was canceled. Uh, their Panda Cup finale was canceled. And instead of having two circuit finale events in December, the Super Smash Brothers community had zero circuit events in, in December um, to end up the circuit. But I wanted to welcome Alan onto the show to talk a little bit about this. He has been mostly silent since uh, the statement that he posted about a month ago as well. And uh, Alan, I want to start with, you know, because this is a big part of my job. Why are you doing this interview? Yeah, thanks. Actually, I wanted to to start off with that exactly, too. So first off, you know, I'm no longer CEO of Panda, as you pointed out. I'm not affiliated with Panda anymore. Uh, this is me as an individual being here. Um, uh, and I want to make that very clear. Okay, so as someone who formerly worked in the Smash community and, and in the esports industry, uh, the reason why I'm here is that it's been over a month and uh, I'm still receiving harassment. I I really want to be able to move on. Uh, I really want to take the next steps in my life. And uh, I've been told through friends uh, that there's still some misconceptions and misunderstandings uh, that are out there um, or some, you know, question marks that people still have. So my hope was that by coming here uh, and addressing some of those or, or all of those that I'd be able to uh, to move on, to, to be able to live my life and for this to just end. You know, I'm a journalist, not a comms person, but I will say, I think, while a lot of what you received, I don't think is necessarily deserved on the death threat side of things. And there's other people that have commented on this uh, as well, such as Ludwig and others that have said the same. But I will say in your blog post, rereading it today before we did this interview, um, there was certainly an aggressive and emotional tone for part of that blog post, especially towards some of your competitors, uh, people like Ken Chin, known as Hotbid, um, also some of the other people involved with BG Bootcamp as well. I do think that that kind of contributed, I think, a little bit to how people feel about what you had to say. I mean, reflecting on that, if you if you had to rewrite the statement, would you and what would you say differently? Look, it, that statement was done under extreme duress. Like I had to flee my home, file police reports like I was afraid I was doing what friends uh, and you know said was the only thing I could do. Imagine writing a statement, collecting evidence and being told the entire time, no matter what I say. Most people won't believe me. Nothing I say will matter. No amount of evidence will matter. And I hadn't said anything publicly at that point. So, and people said that this is, I had to do something that's very atypical of me, which is you, if you don't say anyone's name, no one will believe you even more, even more. It'll be even worse for you. So the thought was that uh, by doing that, that it would help credibility. Uh, I'm not interested in dragging anyone. Um, that again was a statement done under extreme duress. Uh, if I did it again, uh, I don't even want to think about that, that situation. Uh, in a lot of it is in, in sort of the, the, 
moment, right? In the moment of what's happening and in response to that. I mean, sure, I can look back hindsight 2020 if I do it today. No, I would not name certain parties. It's very, like I said, atypical of me. It doesn't make me feel good. Um, but at the time, I was doing what I thought I had to. Well, I don't think it's necessarily just naming parties, though, to be honest. It's the way that they are named. So there are certain parts in that statement in particular uh, where people come up, such as, you know, you uh, characterize Ken, uh, Ken Chen in a, a very specific way, in a way that he was aggressive, which I think you know, a lot of people have vouched kind of the other way. We don't have recordings of your interaction with him to vouch for either side um, of, of what was said. But also things that are just like little in that statement that are little, you know, sort of stabs at people like I don't know who LD is, which obviously LD is the code of founder of BTS, one of your major competitors, at least actually, in the case of what you were doing. Yeah, I didn't know that until he started tweeting about me. Um, I actually did not, uh, wasn't aware of who he was. So I am now. But I think I think that gets to a core oversight that at least when I was reading this and I try to try to be objective here I know basically everyone that's involved in this entire situation from the VG bootcamp people to the beyond the summit people to yourself I've known all of you for an extended period of years yeah. covering this industry and you know pardon me if this is an assumption but I, I think one of the things that was done incorrectly about the Panda Cup and part of the reason that you ultimately ended in the scenario that you did is that you almost worked backwards rather than playing both sides of the ball. Let me explain what I mean by that. Mm -hmm. So you got a license from Nintendo, mm -hmm. a party who, as I mentioned earlier, has a history of canceling these events and being extremely adversarial to the Smash community more broadly um, and really not caring about Smash esports uh, altogether until more recently. And you were not simultaneously other than I, I believe this is right based on your statement other than Justin, who was one of the organizers behind the Smash World Tour, working in tangent to put together sort of this circuit as it was in conversation to be licensed. Is that right? Or were, uh, what were you no, doing? No, there were earlier conversations uh, with other TOs and whatnot, but uh, also Nintendo is a very private company. Um, leaks are not OK. Uh, so I had to keep the circle very small. But from the very beginning, there were multiple TOs, uh, Melee and Ultimate, that were involved uh, in structure and you know uh, creating the the circuit from the ground up. So there were other people, other parties involved. Not every party uh, that one could, would consider a major party. Uh, like I said, I kept the, the circle fairly small to prevent any leaks and whatnot from happening. Plus, look, if leaks come out and things don't happen, people get upset. It sucks. You know how many times... Like rumors had spread about, uh, you know, potential circuits happening in, in Smash and they never panned out. And, you know, that, that's rough. That's rough. I didn't want to be, I don't want to partake in that or, or be another one of those rumors in the wind that never, you know, uh, uh, materialized, you know. Your background, though, is not in tournament organizing. And I think Correct. like that, you know, it, you you all, Panda, prior to the Panda Cup, et cetera, were an esports team. You had fielded various different amounts of rosters. You, you also hardware manufacturing. You have put out a a dock for the uh, Nintendo Switch to play Super Smash Brothers on, or Super Smash Brothers with the GameCube controller on the go. You know, you had other hardware projects that were ultimately canceled uh, due to some other production issues. But this is not your background. And so what was the decision to go alone in this versus from the very start, potentially creating a joint venture with someone like Beyond the Summit or one of the other parties? It, I feel like if it, that would have eliminated a lot of this hostility, I feel like. Sure. Yeah. Uh, at the end of the day, they are separate businesses. Uh, you know, really Panda's background, uh, you know, we started as a team in sort of what I call phase one of the company from like 2015 to 2019. We were privately funded by myself and, and my co-founder, um, you know, out of pocket completely. Um, and, you know, we hadn't received any investment at that point. But part of, uh, you know, scaling up the company and part of this partnership uh, we started talks about mid 2019, like it started getting serious around then Nintendo. So we end up getting invested in, we end up seeking investment for the first time and getting invested in uh, early 2020, but about January, uh, right before the lockdown happened. Uh, and the purpose was to build out something larger to support the community because our background was a team, yes, but we also did rankings. We did the doc. The doc itself, you have to keep in mind, it's a niche hardware product, right? We developed, we are indeed it from the ground up as a smash solution to a, to a problem that only smashers really had it was targeted just for the community right so our background wasn't really just that of 
competition. And we also had done events, by the way, too. And we had actually run some tournaments as well. Uh, our history from our perspective was that of supporting the community infrastructure, right? The reason why I think it made a lot of sense why we were the ones to, to sort of get that sort of contract is that broadcasting wasn't important to us, really. That wasn't the point. Elevating broadcasts was the point, right? We actually had invested in and did a lot of things, which we can talk about later to to do that, right? And so why didn't we talk to those guys? Uh, a, like I said, I you know didn't really want to bring people in until things were finalized. And B, it, broadcasting was not the focus whatsoever. Uh, that was a secondary thing. And uh, production actually was more important to us than the broadcast location. Um, you know, our Twitch contract that we had was a, a, a zero CPM contract. The Panda Cup streams made no money. Money and revenue is not the purpose of the Panda Cup streams. Um, it, they, the, the reason for the contract was that they, they wouldn't play ads randomly, which they do if you don't have a, a contract with them. So, you know, that's why I think it made sense for us or and why we didn't approach those before that time. Yeah, but you have to understand in a community this, and, and this is the role of Beyond the Summit that they've taken, especially over the past two years as COVID has made things more difficult for small businesses. You have to understand that part of, and I'm sure you do now, but maybe not at the beginning, is that in a world where, you know, let's break Super Smash Brothers esports down to a science. Most of these tournaments started, even the big ones, started as a smaller group of people organizing locally in their region, right? This is a bootstrapped kind of from from the ground up you know people lugging around crts everything else this is not this is not publisher esports where publishers are you know sort of uh have well-established circuits or whatever it may be well-established events etc you're working with so many different parties and a lot of these people that are tournament organizing don't have sales capabilities they some of them have broadcast capabilities some of them do not and so when there is a party like Beyond the Summit who is offering them the opportunity to run a lot of that for them, but also financially subsidize them, that's a huge opportunity. And I think that's part of why Beyond the Summit was is so welcomed among the Smash community. It's because you're dealing with people that, that maybe this isn't their expertise. Money's already hard enough to scrape by. So when you have somebody that's offsetting that with partnerships, et cetera, and then, you know, that that's their value add. And And I think that Versus you, you're walking, you walked into a competitive community already that had something pretty well established for itself. So I would actually say that, first of all, like you said, the, there's a lot of things I didn't have the knowledge of before uh, that uh, that came in later, right? Uh, it, you know, you also have to keep in mind that, that people that we had hired at Panda, a lot of these people worked with all, all those broadcasters, all the same people. We have TOs, like you go to a tournament and you would have like talked to people there. I would be surprised if the majority of people didn't have a friend or knew somebody that worked at Panda, like personally, right? We had the, we were a company of 99% smashers over 150, uh, you know, members, including contractors, freelancers. It's a big number because we had a lot of little jobs here and there too, but uh, they were all very important to the greater, uh, you know, team, the greater scheme of things. So, you know, that's, we were assembled from the community in general, but you're talking about things as if they were established, right? Sales and partnerships, BTS doing that for events was not established until the Papa John's deal was made public. Before that time, they had done little things here and there, but there was not like a team that did sales for all these events. That was another thing that we were, we were there for. We were there for infrastructure. We were there to help growth. We were there to, to just straight up help right? We were there to help pay costs. Like, so BTS, uh, you know, for example, as a broadcaster, as uh, a, one of many uh, or one of several different broadcasters that were out there, they typically did not offer production. I, I believe they had the capabilities of that they used to, but they were really just uh, about broadcast rights and about purchasing broadcast rights from, from uh, events and giving them a cut of the revenue. So they, the events would be hiring different production companies. Um, and we were using the same production companies that those events were using. Um, you know, really great people, uh, you know, that were out there. So it's a lot like, I want to say messier than you think. It wasn't like a clear solution. There wasn't a one size fits all that, that worked for every event. Uh, and a lot of it was scattered, uh, at the end of the day. And, and a lot of it was not really established. Um, uh, so, and even then, you know, uh, we wanted, and we believe we could help where areas where people weren't doing, right. We had to to grow the team in places that we, you know, again, didn't know. Well, the Papa John's deal was a very hush-hush thing uh, that was not revealed until it was public. 
I, I only found out about it about a couple weeks before it did go public. So, and again, we, we were fine with that. It was, it was awesome. You know, more support for the events, the better. We were about community events. We were about the community and we had built an entire business around supporting those events. Um, and I mean, I could go into details about exactly how we did it. We spent years preparing for this and, and, and growing things for the sake of making Smash, helping Smash become a tier one esport. Because I believed, and honestly, I still believe that Smash has everything it needs, right? It has amazing storylines, it has tons of events, it has a very rich community, it has a powerful IP, it has all of the elements. And if you remove the barriers of getting into Smash competitively, and if you also bring the publisher in, because being official is very important to, to get to that next level, right? Um, then Smash could be huge. The community can grow. It, we can we can uh, you know achieve something incredible together. The point of Panda, and I told this to many different TOs uh, over the uh, the years. The point of Panda was that we didn't want one hundred percent of the pie. We wanted ten percent of a much bigger pie. The goal was to grow the pie, right? And then we all get more pie in the day. You know, that was my, that was the business strategy that I created. And that was this is one of my canned phrases uh, that I would say over and over again is the, the pie thing uh, to the point that my team hated hearing the, top, the pie thing. So I'd say it all the time um, because that was our philosophy. That's what we believed. If we just grew the whole community, then we'd all benefit and we'd all grow and careers would be made where there weren't any. Right. A lot of people are struggling to to make ends meet and and you know they want to put everything they have into Smash. That that's their passion, that's what they love. Uh they can't raise a, a family and the money they're making. They eventually have to leave, right? Uh there is no career, there is no long term stability in the community. And that was something we wanted to fix. Personally, I wanted to fix. That was that was a big passion point of mine. That's why uh, you know, I didn't take a dime out of the company because at the end of the day, I was there to make careers, make jobs. Uh, that was why I did what I did. You mentioned that it was an important part, though, to be official Nintendo license. And there's actually a quote. I went back and watched a lot of the content around this today from Ludwig Ogren, uh on his mobile mail on your statement. And it, and this is about you. Uh, he, Alan, goes on to say that he wasn't in this for the money. He's never been paid. He didn't want the whole pie. He just wanted to create an ecosystem where people could thrive through Smash, like yeah. you just said. Yes. But here's the second part. I believe, Alan, I believe that he wanted Smash to be a Tier 1 eSport, but he made one mistake. He bent the knee fully and completely to uh, Nintendo. And as much as he might hype up the contributions that Nintendo helped make the Panda Cup a possibility, they've also worked twice, three times, ten times as hard to hurt and shut down the competitive scene time and time again. So, and I, and I, wanna, I just want to say, I was like, I think that's the missing part of everything you just said. A moment yeah. ago is that you are it, it would be different if you were working with a publisher that had no involvement if you're working with a valve or whatever right and they they were just hands off really they you know they did the license thing they you know helped sort of determine counter-strike managers that's a totally different scenario you're working with a publisher though that is for valid reasons given a lot of tos a ton of hesitation with dealing with them period because they've mm -hmm. shown that they're not afraid of throwing legal legal threats at people to make them shut down and and you just said a lot of these tournament organizers aren't super wealthy or sophisticated or any yep. means. So they can't fight a legal fight against a multi-billion dollar game co corporation, right? They just, they do have to just walk away. And so I think that's, that's the missing context there is your partner in this sort of pursuit for better or for worse has a history of that. Okay. So let me, let me actually address that because this is a very good point. Uh, and again, through friends, this is something that I've heard uh, a lot um, over and over again, that, People believe something, I think, uh, incorrect. When I when we had the conversation with Nintendo in mid-2019 that really kick-started the concept of the, of the partnership and led to, you know, what uh, the Panda Cup would become, um, you know, Nintendo made it very clear to me that earlier that year, they had decided they were going to change their relationship with the Smash community, that they were done with the status quo, Right the the rollout of that change is was delayed due to covid but nintendo was going to come in and change things regardless of panda panda's presence what what do you what do you mean by changing things though? i do, do you mean not, shutting shutting yeah, everything else no, down I've, or do you mean or do you mean doing what you ultimately did which is run a circuit on their behalf so uh, i do not have the answer to that i don't know 
the only things I knew about Nintendo's change in stance to the community were things that they shared with me, which were contextual things for Panda or the Panda Cup. Uh, they didn't tell me their their whole grand scheme of things, but they did publicly say some things. Uh, like, for example, commercial events going forward will have to be licensed. That was a policy change, right? That They, they said that in an interview. Uh, I don't think people really picked up on that. Nintendo wasn't actually going around shutting down events left and right. They really just wanted events to to protect their IP, right? And they, the amount of times they actually shut things down, quote unquote, is what, th three, four times in, in Smash's history. And don't get me wrong, those actions happened, right? But I, Panda and me, had nothing to do with Nintendo coming in. And people think that we did. In reality, the Panda Cup was designed, well, there's a couple of different designs, a couple of different reasons for it, right? Number one was we wanted to be a, 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 a conduit for the community. So being able to go to sponsors and not only just say, hey, do you want to sponsor this event, this event, this event, this event, but then we say, hey, here's a big finale that's going to have, you know, over a million dollars poured into it. Uh, you know, do you want to, you know, this is another big thing you can sponsor. And on top of that, a sponsor says to us, uh, and this actually happened, can we put Mario in our app? And because of our relationship with Nintendo, we were actually able to say yes. These are the, the stipulations. These are the, 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 you know, what you have to follow, but you can, right? That has tremendous value to it. Okay. So the, the, you know, the attention, the sponsorship income that we were getting, uh, you know, really was to be distributed and shared among the community events that were part of the Panda Cup. Uh, that was number one. And we, we did accomplish that even in, in year zero, like, uh, take, uh, the big house, for example. They were in a very lucky position. They were a big event uh, that was sort of a few months into it. Within five months of launching the Panda Cup, I put this in my statement, we did $2 million in sales, uh, and it was it was growing still. Uh, and all of those sales, by the way, were just for the finale. None of them actually included community events. I told the sales team to go back and add on community events to the contracts for no additional money for our point so we could share the money. Because that was important, because I said to them, I want to show these TOs the value of the Panda Cup to them from the beginning, you know, before we're even fully established, before we get our legs, right? So uh, Big House, uh, before 2022, the, the most money they made was about $12,000 from sponsorships, right? Uh, and that's, you know, uh, for the cost of the event, a drop in the bucket. It's great. It tremendously helps them pay costs, but that's fairly low. Uh, the Papa John sponsorship they got last year was $15,000. Panda was able to bring forty thousand dollars of sponsorships within a few months of sales to big house okay so and with less actual deliverables than the papa john sponsorship was asking so we were bringing more money with less restrictions right that was the that was the number one point of the panda cup but the number two point which relates to what we were talking about before uh was that i knew pa uh, nintendo was coming in i did not know how nintendo was coming in and they were going to come into the community uh, and make some changes the Panda Cup was designed as a barrier between Nintendo and the community. Nintendo's microscope, their scrutiny of the community could be done on the Panda Cup and not on community events. So tangibly, that means like uh, events that were streamed on the Panda Cup channel. You may see there was two different sponsor rotations. Okay, there was an event sponsor rotation and there was a Panda Cup sponsor rotation. The reason why there was two separate ones was that we had different sponsor restrictions. I was able to negotiate the events having less restrictions, more freedom in exchange for the Panda Cup having more restrictions. And that was okay with us. Like, don't get me wrong, we were fine with that. Uh, and we were totally okay with that. But the goal was that if we took on all of those restrictions and we took on the burden, then Nintendo's attention would be on us and the community events would be completely free to do to keep their identity and be themselves. So that was actually a big point of what the Panda Cup was doing. Now, that barrier is gone. I, I'm not with Panda anymore. I don't know what their plans are. I would be shocked if they try to revive the Panda Cup this year. Um, I don't know what's going to happen without that. I don't know what Nintendo's intentions are here. But I do know, for example, every event this year that was major, as far as I know, uh, was licensed. Um, Genesis, 
uh, you know, Low Tide City, Riptide, uh, Shine, all of those events this year uh, were um, licensed, even though they didn't, you know, I don't think they said that out loud uh, and they weren't on the Panda Cup, but they were. So these this shows you the change that Nintendo is doing. So Panda bending the knee was about being able to allow the community to be free and allow the community to keep their identity in exchange for us having more restrictions and more oversight, which again was okay with us. I actually think it helped us make better products. Well, I think part of the core issue here though is sort of, this is a critique you can read from people like Bobak, who's the, the creator of Genesis, the Genesis event, the thing you can read from Hotbid, that you can read from Deer, who's from the Battle of BC, that, you know, a lot of the issues surrounded, I think, with your communication to them and your role as that conduit from Nintendo to the community and sort of uh, some of these people, longstanding figures in the community, they've ran tournaments for decades in some cases. And there is pretty much universal that you made a universal allegation from a lot of those organizers that you made an overture that it was join the Panda Cup or face a painful death basically that you were you were going to you know that nintendo was going to come shut you down right and, and if you're saying if you're saying that you didn't know what nintendo's plans were mm -hmm. here then if that overture was made and i want you to talk about this if that overture was made that seems preemptive if you don't know what the actual okay. plan yes were. so let me be very very clear i never threatened any event that they would be shut down ever Okay. Anyone who felt that may have been the case, I can 120% guarantee you that was a misunderstanding. Okay. Here's the, someone gave me this metaphor and, and I want to share it with you because I actually liked it a lot. Um, when I went to the negotiation table with these TOs, I thought they would see me as a peer, one of them, right? Part of the Smash community. Um, and instead, what they saw was at the same negotiation table that there was a loaded gun being pointed at them. Simply because, well, well, because you're working with Nintendo, right? right. That's part the of the problem. shadow of Nintendo behind us. Said, now, yeah, my perspective was that of one of them, right? Like I was not there to hurt them; I was there to help them. I was, I was an ally. But in the exact same conversation, right, that you're having, the exact same words exchange, the perception can be wholly different if you see this phantom gun. To me, I didn't have that gun. I can't snap my fingers and make a multi-trillion-dollar company jump and do what I tell them to. It's not possible. But they thought I could. And I didn't know that in the beginning, right? I didn't understand that. That's my fault. And I take full responsibility and ownership of that. I didn't realize that was their perspective for a while. And I talked about that in my statement. The first couple of weeks, right? There was a lot of misunderstandings and you know, people were a bit confused. And things were moving fast. That was why. That perception difference between the two of us. I made a lot of changes when I heard, unfortunately, through uh, through other people, not directly through, from the TOs. I made a lot of changes to, to try to make sure that there was no misunderstanding, that they couldn't think that they would get shut down if they don't work with us. I shared evidence in my statement of, of people who didn't work with us, who didn't work with us last year, uh, messages I sent them saying, you know, I hope, uh, you know, I hope you have a great event this year. Uh, and, you know, please let me know what, uh, you know, we can do next year to improve our offering uh, and help support your continued success. That was a copy paste that I did to multiple TOs because I didn't want people thinking that not working with us would mean you get shut down, which is crazy. That's not the that's not true at all. That's not the point. And then now the thing is, though, I understand. I get it. I get their perspective. But what am I supposed to do if they don't if they weren't comfortable talking to me? I couldn't correct that perspective. So. I couldn't explain them that, no, 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 that was never the intention, that that must be a misunderstanding, because why would I threaten events? It it doesn't make sense to me to do so, right? And I don't have the insight into what Nintendo was planning on doing. I do know that they wanted a commercial events licensed. I don't know what's going to happen to events that aren't licensed. I have no insight into that. None. Didn't then, and I mean, I haven't talked to Nintendo since uh, the day before I stepped down, so, you know, less now. Um, so, okay, that's really the case. And the, we, the changes that we made. So I started making these long decks that had every little detail. I made a multi, I think it was like a 12 page or something, uh, you know, a document that really went into details about like every little thing because of these misunderstandings. So I didn't want them to think anything like what you're saying. 
Uh, and then even in starting about September, every talk uh, I had with a community member, there was always three pandas specifically because I wanted people there to corroborate anything that was said to correct me. If I said anything that could sound wrong uh, and to also have someone else there, if they didn't feel comfortable reaching out to me, they could reach out to any of the other people that were in the call. That was the point. So I was, you know, trying to take accountability and responsibility for the, the idea that words of mine were being misunderstood because they were, and these were words I used. And I, and again, I take responsibility for that, but I, I didn't know what else I could have done. I, I tried my best to correct those misunderstandings, but yeah. So I want to specifically call out one of one of the things that was said uh, and get your response to it, which was from Bobak, specifically the creator of Genesis, which was uh, one thing for sure that was constantly reiterated in our calls, calls between him and yourself and your mm -hmm. team, was that the Smash World Tour would be canceled, that the Smash World Tour was blacklisted, that Gimmer, the creator of uh, one of the creators of the Smash World Tour and VG Bootcamp, uh, was blacklisted and it was only a matter of time before they were shut down because, quote, trust me, I know. Trust me was a term he used a lot. There was no trust. He at one point called himself, quote, the savior of Smash, end quote, on a call when he went on a rant about how great of a position he's in to do good for the community and how all of his hard work pay paying off to bring everyone together. Did you at any point say that, that you knew the Smash World Tour was going to be canceled? Yes. And let me clarify this. Okay. So first of all, they, uh, every TO in the beginning would ask me, you know, the Panda Cup's happening, right? Uh, what does that mean for Smash World Tour? I was then put into a position. Do I be honest with them? Tell them what I know. Or do I hide it from them? And, and what did you know, to be clear? At, so I knew for a very long time that Nintendo was not fond of the Smash World Tour and what they were doing. They came up in conversations before in the past Nintendo and the word cease and desist were used multiple times. I was under the full impression that the Smash World Tour was going to be the target for one of Nintendo's few times that they were going to you know, stop something from happening in the community. Um, and they asked me. So I, like I said, I could have hid that I knew, but I wanted them to trust me. Exactly, exactly what he's saying. I wanted them to trust me, so I didn't want to hide anything from them. I wanted to show them that this is what I know, right? I did not take any action to shut down Smash World Tour ever, period, at any point. Okay. In fact, I did the opposite. Every time it was mentioned by Nintendo, I said, that would be a very bad idea. Please do not do that. Okay. Because I know that it would harm the community. It would harm us. VGBC events were also not given licenses. And what's funny is, I had a, a to-do list, a, a, a sticky note, okay, on, on my, my monitor. Uh, and on the sticky note, I had a to-do list of to things to, to do with Nintendo and talking with them and meetings with them because we met uh, often. And I had a reminder list that I would tell them because we had a lot of moving pieces. So I would say uh, every two weeks, I would do the reminder list. And on the reminder list was, please consider licensing VGBC offense. I would love to work with them someday. I reminded Nintendo and told them over and over again that we would like them to license VGPC events from our perspective, which goes to show you how much pull I actually had in Nintendo, which was not very much. Because did they give happen. you a rationale as to why they didn't do that, though? No, no, they did not. Um, and you know, also keep in mind that uh, from my perspective, right from what I was hearing from them, I did believe that the uh, um, Smash World Tour would be told not to continue, uh, almost more imminent. Now. I'd only really told about four to five TOs about this. Uh, and this is all in the very beginning. And the reason was, the, uh, like I said, number one, they asked me. So I wanted to be honest and transparent with them. Uh, number two was that in the very beginning, and I put this in my statement, Nintendo was not able to issue licenses to events that were part of an unlicensed circuit. I was only able to work with licensed events. Right? So... That meant that I couldn't work with events that were on Smash World Tour in the beginning. That was not our design. That was not my choice. Okay. Uh, and there was only one event, actually, that was within our, our launch window that we actually wanted that was on Smash World Tour. Um, and they said very respectfully, and that was Gommel. They said, you know, we already promised Smash World, like we want to join Panda Cup, but we already promised Smash World Tour we'd be on, the, on their circuit. Uh, and we don't want to go back on that. And I said, 
Okay. I totally understand. And that's fine. And they actually helped me. They actually helped talk to Nintendo because they had direct contact with Nintendo as well uh, to convince them to overturn that and, and, and make that restriction not the case anymore. It took about six weeks. Uh, and by early mid-May, I believe, uh, that was lifted. And as soon as that was lifted, awesome. I was happy. Gommel said, yep, we would love to join. Great. Uh, and then other TOs that asked me later on said, you know, we're on the Panda Cup. Hey, do you mind if we join the Smash World Tour? I would tell them, yeah, absolutely. Do what is best for your event. I want you to do everything you can. And I told many TOs after that was, was lifted, I do not consider the Smash World Tour a competitor. Uh, and this became one of my canned phrases. They're doing their thing, which is fantastic. And we're doing our thing. We're making two completely different products. I think the community will see that after the finals are done. Um, the only thing I hope is that they don't take our finals date again in the future. Um, so that was it. And after that restriction was lifted, I didn't hear a peep from Nintendo about shutting down Smash World Tour. So I assumed it was over. I assumed that that thought process had been you know, done, which I'd never seen before. Because for years up to that point, I'd known that Nintendo was not fond of them. And so I don't even know the history there. I did mention all of this in my statement as well. Nintendo had three rules um, that they told TOs. And this is way back in the day. These things have changed since then. But before Panda was even launched and established, they Nintendo had direct contact with many of the TOs that are still around. And they gave them three rules. They said, number one, no mods, which you know, Nintendo's stance on mods is, is very uh, open and, and, and public. Number two, don't put Smash in the name of your event. And number three, don't make a circuit. You do those three, you good. Okay, you, we have no problem. There was a fourth unsaid rule, which was if we tell you don't do something and you do it, that's not good. Which I think, I mean, any company in the world, that would be a, a thing, right? Uh, so uh, those are the rules, right? And they talked to Smash World Tour before they launched and told them, do not launch. Smash World Tour in 2022, 2020, excuse me, launched breaking two of the three rules and having been told not to do it, did it anyways. So yeah, I was not the only one that was told directly by Nintendo within the community that they were not fond of the Smash World Tour. So again, this is the, the context here. My hope was not to attack them or hurt them. And I made actions. I took many actions to try to help them behind the scenes because I didn't want them shut down. Again, motives, right? You have to look at motives. Why would I do that? It would hurt me for them to get shut down because I know the community. I've been in the community for 15, 16 years personally. Pan's been around for nine. The community will be very mad if Smash Up was shut down. So I tried very hard and told Nintendo over and over again, please don't do that. I don't control a multi trillion dollar company. All I can do is advocate behind the scenes. So, but I think the the predicament that you're in, and I think uh, there's part of your statement that talks about sort of the timeline here. You got greenlit for the Panda Cup in in March 2022, and then you were able to, uh, you know, then you started kind of doing more of that outreach to TOs, the ones that you had not preemptively talked to. I understand from the perspective of a tournament organizer, especially again because these are not major, or a lot of them are not major organizations with a mm -hmm. lot of people, you know this is oh, sometimes their side gig or whatever. They have full-time jobs outside of this. It's not something that can make them a living, even the top, you know, for some of the biggest events. I understand that if you have groundwork laid a year ahead of time, which some of them do, being able to pivot away from something that they had already committed to, Smash World Tour, a Beyond the Summit broadcast, whatever it may be, being able to pivot away from that for your circuit literally you know within a year of any of these events with nine months with any of these events is nigh impossible and i think like that's well, what was the solution then in your opinion to like that you could offer them to make that easier because that that's the biggest problem here is how are you supposed to recruit events in within nine months uh, it at, was, at the latest it, it was optional jo joining the panda cup was optional i i didn't need every event in the world to join us uh, I offered it to all the major events, but the ones that had had uh, you know pre-existing agreements that would that overlapped couldn't join, and that's fine. But again, once that exclusivity thing got lifted, you know, again, not my choice. There wasn't really any conflicts, and the original design of the Panda Cup version one of the Panda Cup, which I'd mentioned again in my statement, 
uh, had us doing a side stream for every event. The concept was like a jump off, like we want to do an analyst desk, desk sort of thing, add value uh, uh, to the, the events. So we actually didn't want broadcast rights, uh, you know, from to take away broadcast rights from anyone. We just want to do a side stream and we just, but we need permission for that. So, uh, you know, again, we weren't actually looking to overlap with BTS or with VGBC. We were not looking to cause any competition. Our hope was to slip into the current ecosystem and just be complementary uh, and be value adding to the community. That was uh, many of our goals. So, um, yeah, I think that's, you know, uh, again, I wasn't, again, not trying to get everyone. It was completely optional. Join us or not. Totally fine. People were licensed outside the Panda Cup. And uh, number two, it, we were trying to be non-invasive as much as possible. So plus from year zero, we did try to make sure people made money if they joined the Panda Cup. Not everyone could make a lot of money, but money was distributed, sometimes a very significant amount of money. I, I put in my statement, we spent $50,000 on one event, $90,000 on another event. Like they got a lot out of this. It was a very lucrative offer that we had offered them, that we they would give them. And you know what? Only a few people uh, offered to take it in the first year. And that's fine. That was okay with us. We weren't looking to sign on everyone to the big package. There were multiple packages. Um, we were just hoping to get our legs. That's it. We're going to open audience questions here in a moment. So if you are one of the notable community members from the Smash community listening to this, please uh, come up and ask your question. Um, you can reach out to the company account, to the Overcome account, to uh, sort that out as well. Um, Alan, I want to ask a couple different questions, though. One about the statement itself, but we covered this a little briefly, is for better or for worse, there was hostility towards people in your statement. And... Uh, Certainly in the way that and I understand you explained earlier, it was written under duress and, and you were overwhelmed and, and scared and anxious. Um, how do you feel about what you wrote about people like Hotbid and Gimmer and others now a month later? Uh, I didn't feel good even a couple days after I wrote it. Uh, that doesn't make me feel good. I don't like dragging people or, or speaking ill of individuals. So again, I did what I thought I had to and it was under duress. Um, I don't have ill will towards anyone. I really don't. I really wanted to work with everyone because I, I still to this day believe that there were ways that we could work together and all achieve the same goals and be happy. There is a kumbaya moment, uh, a rainbow at the end that we could have led to and just didn't happen. And, you know, I actually blame myself for a lot of it too. Like the conversation, the second conversation I had, um, you know, with BTS that conversation did not go very well. In fact, uh, a lot of people noted uh, the PR statement. So the statement we Panda made on Friday, uh, after all that went down, uh, I was at that point incapacitated by sort of panic attacks and whatnot. Uh, I, 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 for the first time in our history, I couldn't really do the crisis management that I normally would have been able to do. Um, and so it was chosen to outsource it to PR companies. So the two PR companies, two legal firms, two corporations went through the statement that we ended up posting. Uh, the thought for that statement was, uh, that, uh, the, one of the PR companies said, you have to admit something. You can't say that you didn't do anything. Uh, and you have to show what accountability you took because people don't want the truth. People don't want to hear your perspective. People want accountability. So that was the thought behind that. Uh, and that specifically was referring to that second conversation with uh, the broadcaster uh, that I raised my voice in that, that one instance out of frustration. Uh, and that's not okay. That's not okay to me. That's not okay to the standards of professionalism I, I put for Panda. And that was not okay to um, Nintendo either, What the standard that they have for their partner. So that was a truthful part, but that was all it was referencing. And we made tons of changes on the back end. So even if people can't believe my words, I asked for them to look at my actions. After that very difficult conversation with BTS, I completely changed our business model. I reached out four or five times to them, trying to make the peace, trying to clear up any misunderstandings, apologize uh, for those misunderstandings, because they were misunderstandings. I never threatened them and never wanted them to feel that way. Um, and 
but they did. And that is my fault that they felt that way, that I couldn't do a good enough job of, of explaining that that wasn't the case, that that's not my intention. So yeah, I look at this and I look at the things I posted, right? And I just think of how I screwed up, how I could have done better, what else I could have done, because that's, again, I understand the perspective. You know, I understand that the how Ken felt, right? And I, I get that he felt threatened, even though that's not my intention. I get why these people well, felt I think part, I think part of that, though, is because, and I saw this from a lot of other people, other tournament organizers, not just Ken, not just Bobak, not others, even smaller ones, was that you were making overtures or offering to buy these tournaments out and to purchase them in their entirety. Uh, uh, a few people said, said that. Yeah. Let's so, know. Okay. I, yeah. I understand how that makes people feel threatened. Sure. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I understand that. Um, there is, uh, there are about three or four TOs, I believe, last year that we had offered that to. And um, the concept was for two things. Number one, financial stability. Uh, and number two was for uh, uh, being able to invest into the events more. So we uh, spent a lot of money on the events. Like I said, uh, that event we spent 50K on, we made maybe three to $4,000 of merchandise sales. The 90K one, we made like 13, 14K of merchandise sales. We were not making a whole lot of money. That wasn't the point. Again, it was it was about growth in the beginning. Um, so uh, we want to be able to invest in them so I can go to investors and say, look, you know, it makes sense for this. So, and also, like you know, many events are not well to do. Many TOs put their houses on the line, right, to, to run their events. They don't have budgets, right? They don't know how much money they're going to have until people sign up. Uh, and then they know what they're doing. So they have to take risks. They're going to pay broadcasters a certain amount of money, you know? So the point of the acquiring events thing was because of stability and to invest more into them. But I told the TOs in the very beginning, I do not want to acquire an event without you, the, the main TO, the creator, intrinsically involved with control at the very least. I would, I would want you creatively involved at the very least, because we are not looking to strip the identity of the event. We're not looking to take anything from it. And, and let me give you the exact deal. Okay. The deal was that they would be hired as the uh, director of the event. Okay. For multiple years with minimal or no oversight from us. Okay. That they would be getting a salary that was equal to or greater than any sort of profit that they made or any, anything they pocketed from years before. They would get a budget from the very beginning. They would get 25% of any profits they made for the event with no financial liability. They don't have to worry about things going under or things not working. They also would get a bonus if they went under budget. And on top of all of that, the, one of the biggest reasons why we did it was Panda had an incredible team. Incredible team. We had really great people. And they could hire our services if they wanted to, their choice, at a discount. Video editors, graphics, uh, TOs, we had everything that they could possibly want. And we were, and because they're part of the Panda family, we'd be able to offer that to them at a discount, right? So if they wanted it, that was the point, right? It, they had to be involved. They had to preserve their identity. They, it, it still had to be their event. There would be no world. We want it without it being their event. So it wasn't about, I don't know, some monopoly that I was trying to create. It was about stability and being able to invest more into events with financial reason. So, yeah, I, I can understand. Again, I understand. I understand people's perspectives that they felt threatened or turned off by it. I get it. But I don't know, man. I just wish they would talk to me. I wish they would bring it up with me. And, and asked me these things or, or felt comfortable enough to do so. You mentioned that team. And I, I want to end with two things for me before we open up audience questions. Appreciate people listening and being patient with us here. Uh, the first is, is that team. I've talked to a lot of people involved with Panda. And, you know, now I think that they, some of them I think feel very unstable now. I mean, some of them also had dangers to themselves here too throughout all of this um, in terms of, you know, them having to, like you, uh, escape your home and, and fear of being doxxed or anyone harming them. Um, 
What do you have to say about the, the team that's left at Panda and kind of the pieces they're picking up? Uh, I mean, I understand you're not running the ship anymore, but you're still actively involved from an equity perspective, correct? You've not sold sold not off, really active, your shares of the company passively. Uh, I'm working on the divestment. I mean, it's uh, I have gotten interest. It's most certainly not the best environment to sell shares in a tech or esports company. Uh, not only the holiday season, but uh, you know, with all the changes going on and the implosion of esports, I think honestly happening, uh, it's kind of rough out there. So it'll take time, but it is going on. Um, and you know, being a shareholder doesn't mean I'm active at all in it. I actually don't know uh, the full team that's left at Panda. Um, so at the end of the day, though, first of all, uh, the treatment of people who were proud to work at Panda, who who you know made like you know put part of their their names and everything it was mind-boggling it was absurd these people care so much about the smash community and the people that they worked so hard for to give back to 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 help grow and, and create cool things for were threatening them to the point of of fearing for their lives and that's that's why I, I was telling the PR companies in the first couple of days, I was like, I, I'm okay stepping down. Like immediately when the stuff don't went down, I'm like, if I need to step down, I will, because it, the team is more important to me than anything else. And the treatment they were getting was extreme. People are, were harassed. People who are dependent on their income were harassed to the point of having to leave. And now I don't know how they're going to make ends meet. I, I truly hope they can find other work because that's, that's insane to me. That's awful for them. So, you know, that is, it, yeah, that's incredibly rough, honestly. But I do believe the few people that are left at Panda that I know of, I believe they're, they're an incredible team. I don't know if Panda will be able to land on his feet. I think it's still going through a lot of things uh, on the back end stuff. Holiday season, you know, really, I think, pushed off a lot of things. Um, uh, but I think that if anyone can do it, it's a team that's, le that's left there. Um, and I believe in them. I really do. I believe in the entire team that we had, uh, every single person, but the team that's left there really do care. And I think they can do it if anyone can. I don't know. Um, the only things I really see are the same things that are public like you uh, and everyone else. Were, were you made aware prior to the conversation that happened between the Smash World Tour and Nintendo? Were you made aware that uh, during the week of Thanksgiving, were you made aware that that call would be happening? 15 minutes before the call happened, uh, I was told that they were going to be having a discussion with them and uh, telling them they don't want them to continue in 2023. Uh, and that the only reason they were letting me know was as an FYI, in case a little bit uh, of hate trickles onto Panda. Uh, no one really expected what happened next. And the last point I'll make before we start taking some audience questions, because we do have a few of them, is um, do you feel now, reflecting a month later after your statement, a month after the scandal, um, that you in any way misrepresented yourself as a representative of Nintendo. Again, that phantom loaded gun being pointed at people. Um, that was not at all the intention, but just the, 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 the shadow of Nintendo behind us made that de facto happening. But you have to also keep in mind that I was also working towards phasing myself out because the only thing connecting, you know, any, uh, uh, distrust people had was me. So m the last time I was going to be talking to TOs was establishing for 2023 and introducing them to the other people that were in the call. Those people were going to be handling the relationship with the TOs going forward. I was already being uh, removing myself from it and, and being separated away because we didn't want people to feel that way. We didn't, I'm not a representative of Nintendo. That wasn't the point. Uh, if anything, again, it was just that difference in perception. You know, I also, directly connected TOs to Nintendo when they asked. I, I showed proof of that evidence. When they asked me, I connected them, and those TOs went on to be licensed and work with Nintendo uh, outside of the Panda Cup, and I had no involvement in that. So there wasn't there wasn't any trying to monopolize the relationship with Nintendo or or licensing. Like I I I clearly showed that I did that. And you know, so I, again I don't know what else I could have done. We're going to start taking our first couple of audience questions, and, and Alan, I appreciate your candor. Zane, you were actually next. Do you want to go ahead with your questions? Sure. I'll go ahead. Hi. Uh, Zane Bonsali here. Uh, I work at BTS currently, former Panda employee. Um, Alan, I wanted to ask, you said earlier that you had heard 
from Nintendo that you had information that Smash World Tour was potentially going to be the target of one of the C&Ds that Nintendo would hand down. And so I want to know, even with what you've said about only hearing about it 15 minutes ahead of time, why you implied in your statement then that Gimmer had shut down intentionally to garner goodwill and to lash out against Panda when it seems like you had information that seemed to show that that at least there was some reason to believe that wouldn't be true, which just to me seems to send a different message than the than what you've been saying about goodwill and working together. So that's my question is why you chose to imply that about Gimmer and VGBC's intentions with the shutdown when you had prior knowledge that they were a potential target for a CND. Oh, let me, all right. I'm trying to switch mics here. Uh, yeah, so uh, let me clarify that. After the uh, exclusivity thing was lifted, I didn't hear anything about Smash World Tour and I was under the impression that they would not be shut down anymore. Um, because the, I was, again, reemphasizing over and over again to Nintendo that we didn't want uh, uh, them shut down. But uh, specifically, the in the statement, again, it was made under, under duress, and I was also trying to answer the same questions that everyone else was. I was trying to figure out why did they get shut down, or why should they shut down their, their finale, because I was reassured personally several times by Nintendo, and they also put it in their statement twice, they told them verbally they could continue their finals in 2022. I do not know. And again, I don't, there was no season assist that was sent, right? Uh, and one of the targets I, I was, uh, let me also clarify that is not one of the targets this year, or something that was like one of the targets, like they have only done that to a few events over the course of the years. Um, and that was sort of one of them that thought would, uh, was that it would happen uh, potentially. So going into that, my impression was that they were, they were going to be fine. And I was also directly told um, before the call and after the call, uh, several times that they did not, that they were not told they had to shut down their finals uh, in 2022. Now, if they misunderstood something, I don't know. I was told by people about like different things. And I tried to include what I knew and come to some conclusions because people were asking me to come to conclusions and because I was trying to figure that myself as well. So, Right now, I'm saying I don't know, and it doesn't really matter to me if they chose to do it on purpose or not. At the end of the day, I do believe Nintendo that they did not tell them to shut down this year or 2022. Uh, but I also believe, uh, you know, them when they talked about the relationship with Nintendo leading up to that, and you know, those different parts of things. So I don't know what the full truth is. I don't know if there's uh, another misunderstanding there, but. That's the, the information that I have, and this is, again, complete transparency and honesty. I think our next question is, I think we got him up here now, is from TK Breezy. TK, go ahead. Okay. Uh, yeah, that was kind of like the same thing I was really about to ask, was because it seems like you're willing to give more information now uh, than you were able to give uh, before. And I was like, is that a... Is that like an NDA thing? Like, you are now out the NDA, NDA with Nintendo because you are not the Panda CEO anymore? Uh, honestly, part of it, uh, and the other part is I, I'm, dude, I'm tired. I really don't want to have to um, be harassed anymore. Uh, and I, I honestly believe that telling the truth uh, is is good for the community. So uh, again, the statement was done under extreme duress. So I, I did what I could. Uh, but at the end of the day, yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I mean, I wasn't trying to hide anything in, in the statement, but I was also trying to focus on what I thought was important too. Uh, and obviously, now a month later, I, I we know the questions that are still remaining. Right, but okay. So outside of that, and just to reiterate, also, I do not believe that you should have gotten any of this like the uh, harassment. I kind of had hoped that like a month had passed and people would just kind of move on and everyone can shake hands, go their separate ways. It fucking sucks that that's not what's happening, but um, it feels as though. Um, if you had this information, you know, that VG Bootcamp could have been shut down for Smash World Tour and stuff like that, if you knew this, and this is things that you've said, because I'm like kind of in the same boat as Zane, it almost feels like this is, this could have been something that may have been talked about between the two of you uh, at an earlier date that probably could have avoided all of this if you had this type of information that you were willing to give to other TOs as a point of being like, hey, 
It may not be the greatest idea to sign on Smash Bros. Tour because this could happen without actually telling Smash Bros. Tour that this could happen. I, I hear you, and hindsight's 2020. Uh, the intention okay. was not that, but also keep in mind, I was under the impression that um, Smash Bros. Tour knew that they were not overly liked because of the events from 2020 and being told don't launch and then doing anyways. I was under the impression that they were fully aware they were on thin ice. So uh, I was not privy to the ha fact they had conversations with Nintendo prior to that point. Uh, and I didn't know that. So that's that's primarily from my perspective why I didn't reach out to them or talk to them about it because I'm like, they knew already. And, you know, it's not my place to do that either. I'm not a representative of Nintendo, right? Um, and so, yeah, like, uh, was I wrong? Uh, I, I, I don't know. I don't know if I was wrong. I, I'm not sure. Okay. Uh, thank you. Our next audience question is going to be from Dr. Piggy. Uh, go ahead with your question. Hi, um, I'm Dr. Piggy. I was an organizer for the Code of Conduct that was active from 2018 to 2020. I wanted to ask, in one of your statements, you mentioned that um, Smash was, or Nintendo was not willing to give licenses due to safety concerns to certain tournaments. Mm -hmm. I wanted you to expand on that, uh, as in what safety concerns was Nintendo caring about? Um, and would we expect if Nintendo were ever involved with the scene to, you know, see band players, uh, bands upheld, that sort of thing? Uh, that gets to a level of detail that I'm, I'm fairly uncomfortable sharing, but I can say that it was about attendee safety. It was about attendee health. Um, security was important to them. Making sure that, you know, uh, things couldn't happen uh, that were, you know, untoward to the attendees. And it was all about attendee safety um, that they they primarily focused on. But I think getting into hard details there was is just, uh, yeah, uh, that would go a little, little farther than I probably should. Okay, I suppose if you, if you could... Priorities, are you willing to talk about that? Attendee safety, yes. Like, but that no one that they had uh, security checks, bag checks, uh, things like that. That was that was pretty important to them. I, I, I again, by the way, I, I was not privy to full conversations with Nintendo um, for individual events. I had a circuit license, not an individual event license, so I don't know uh, the full extent as well that it went. I just know the the things that I was I've seen personally. Well, was Nintendo? I I just want to follow up on that. Was Nintendo asking? you to have those same safety requirements that they were asking other tournament organizers we already had pretty strict safety requirements so when they asked for our safety plans i shared what we had and that was it i mean i assume that we uh, hit all their their checkboxes they needed or looking for the next question we're going to call up uh, i believe he has a couple is from aiden Aiden, go ahead. Hi. Uh, hi, Ellen. What's going on? Um, I just had a couple. I had two questions. Um, just wait, I'll just say the first one. Uh, first one first. Um, I was wondering uh, when it came to the discussions with BTS um, that initially arose because of uh, the issues surrounding broadcast rights. Um, you had mentioned earlier um, sort of like soft confirming, not necessarily anything concrete, but the idea of like tournaments themselves being bought up, that you had like some small scale discussions with certain TOs about that possibility, not necessarily like a threat of doing so, more like cooperating with them to buy them out. And uh, during the broadcast rights discussions with BTS, upon realizing that they already had these broadcast rights contracts, um, it's my understanding that these tournaments or like or BTS rather, uh, were never offered to be bought out of those contracts. And um, in my understanding of like broadcast rights and contracts in like other esports or in sports in general, I a very like natural progression of that conversation might be to offer buyouts of those contracts um, so that you acquire those broadcast rights. But it seemed like the suggestions and counter offers that followed were uh, in different directions. Like you mentioned following up with uh, like the example of the analyst desk, for example, um, and other suggestions that you attempted to reach out to later. And I was wondering why the, uh, why the idea or like concept of just offering to buy those contracts out was never offered. Okay. Uh, that's a pretty easy one. Uh, they were. Uh, I actually didn't bring it up the very first call with them. That was the only suggestion that they had given me. That was like something that they, they thought would be viable was that, you know, you, you'd have to buy us out of the contract. That was what was said. 
Um, and then the second call I actually started with, okay, what would that look like? You know, what would that entail? Uh, it then went on to, to be told to me that it would take a lot of money, uh, months of negotiation, uh, et cetera. And that it, it basically was a pretty clear, it wouldn't happen to the point that I literally wrote, put my hands up. It was a video call, put my hands up and I was like, yo, dude, I was, I was just asking cause you brought it up in the last call. Like that's it. So it, it was actually discussed about purchasing broadcast rights, uh, you know, from them. And that was clearly not interesting to them. And I believe the reasoning being, uh, the, the Papa John's deal, which I was not obviously privy to at the time. Uh, and it took them until the end of the second conversation to mention that they'd already sold sponsorships, uh, again, from events. So that was already discussed and, and yeah. Okay. I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, that's great. That's, that, that's honestly great to know. Um, mm. that, that makes a lot of sense. Um, and then the other question I had was uh, a little different. Um, so the, uh, cause, uh, this is following off of your, uh, conversation with Jacob from earlier where you were discussing, uh, the when you were communicating to TOs mm. that the Smash World Tour was going to be shut down when they if they attempted to run or announced in 2022, and from your perspective, um, that was true, and uh, and that was the reason for like telling the truth to these TOs to like get off on the right foot, which uh, honestly like makes a lot of sense to me. Like that uh, that that tracks. Um, what I was wondering is in VGBC's uh, statement and also from having uh, conversations with uh, the Smash World Tour like later in the year, which tracked pretty consistently with their messaging over the course of that year, they had mentioned getting in communication with Nintendo around the same time when you were uh, when you were communicating that they would be shut down to TOs, that their calls with Nintendo, presumably like the same employees or team at Nintendo. Um, were being told that that wasn't actually the case at all and that they wanted to cooperate with them and provide them a potential opportunity in 2022. And I was wondering why there would be a disparity between your understanding of Nintendo and what they wanted for the tour, which seems in like very different, uh, which seems like in striking opposition to the story that Nintendo themselves seem to be communicating directly to the Smash World Tour team. And I was just, is that like a timeline thing or like wondering why that disparity existed at the time, which is like the end of 2021 when this is happening? No idea. I didn't know about those conversations uh, until the statement came out. Um, I didn't know um, any of that what was happening. I wasn't in those calls. I can only speak to what I was told um, and what I, the information I had. Uh, to which I was, like I said, honest, and and I told people what the information I had. Um, so yeah, I I have no idea why uh, that happened the way it did. Uh, but again, I'm not. Uh, I, I I wasn't there, so I don't know what they were exactly told. Sure, uh, that that definitely makes sense. Um, yeah, thank you, thank you for your time. Yeah, absolutely. We're gonna end out the night, and I know. I know we probably have a ton of people with other audience questions. Sorry, folks. I only told Alan that this is going to be an hour and we are 13 minutes over already. So we're going to end the, the night with a question from Hungrybox. Hbox, go ahead. Obviously, the entire community is very bummed out, sad that we not only had missing out on one circuit, but not both. There was a lot of mud slung in both directions. Um, but what I want to know is two things. First question would be, before this whole debacle happened and the whole statements came out and Smash World Tour was canceled, you and I had a call. And on that call, you know, you were excited to talk about the future of the Panda Cup and, you, you know, you want to know, hey, are, are you going? Are you excited? All that. And that was good. But during that call, like, I feel like you did express to me, you know, your honest thoughts about how valuable it actually is to have an esports team versus, you know, just a Nintendo partnership. And corroborating with Kadoran's statement that you thought there was no value in Melee, that was hurtful for me to hear because I know you've been in the community for a long time. I know you've been as long as that I have. So I want to know, honest and plain right now, do you actually believe in the future of Smash? 
And were you willing to continue having Panda as an org or not? So, uh, yeah, very plainly and clearly, um, Melee, any belief, any uh, not belief in Melee is entirely about content. As a content creator like yourself, who is moved from Melee to Ultimate for your content, it is specifically in uh, on YouTube that I'm talking about it. Uh, it does just doesn't track on YouTube. And not believing in Melee is because I've invested quite literally millions of dollars into different projects and different things to help support the community. And the one thing that I could not get any traction on was Melee content. I will also say that scripted Melee content, I think like, you know, with like fully produced sort of Melee content, I do think that has a place uh, and that does track well on YouTube. It's just a lot more expensive and difficult to make. But Juan, there's a, there's probably only a handful of organizations that have put as much time, effort, and money behind Melee as Panda has, entirely at my direction. We've had two to three Melee players for years. Any time I spoke anything about disbelief of Melee, it is entirely on the YouTube content end. Melee and the future of Smash is still bright. It still can become a tier winning sport. Again, look at look at the actions right that I took, uh, and see how that's inconsistent with someone that would not believe in melee. I I clearly did. I clearly tried to help wherever I could. I clearly talked to everyone about different controller things, uh, and it's different being able to sell across melee, uh, you know, to sponsors and you know to on YouTube for content versus melee as an esport. I very firmly believe in melee as an esport. That's why we've had so many players. That's why we did so many things. Um, and the conversation that we had was about a potential future where we had a content team, and it was specifically content oriented, and about being more content focused overall. Where we wanted to expand and work with people that were outside of just our competitive team, uh, and be more than just that. So it the conversation was one hundred percent entirely content focused. And about content alone. So does that does that make sense? Does that answer your question? More or less, but it did seem on the call that you know I felt like you, you were more concerned about like I guess the profitability of Panda rather than the team itself and the players themselves. It kind of made it seem like you weren't fully committed to the long run of having the esports org. But uh, one other, I mean, yeah, I can. Oh, no, that that was your perception. So clearly, that I said things that made you feel that way. Um, you also have to keep in mind uh, that there's a, there's a lot of pressure on my shoulders to make a profitable company. I don't know if you know, but the industry has been going uh, downhill a lot, a lot, a lot. And all investors, like the word esports is like a bad word to a lot of investors now. Uh, it, it turns them off instantly when you talk to them. So I, you know, I was trying to to keep an organization within esports, but not lose our shirts over it. And at the end of the day, stability is important. Making a stable business is important, not yeah. going under, you know? So so the last thing I'll say, because it's been a mm -hmm. question that's thing on everyone's mind. Yeah. Did Nintendo shut down the controller or the Panda controller? Or was it COVID related? And full I just want full honesty on that question. Full honesty on the question, it was a mixture of things. Nintendo did want us to go through the licensing process for it. But there was COVID-related supply chain difficulties. We did not lie about that. Uh, the demand for the controller was a lot higher than anticipated. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I think 12,000 controllers uh, that were bought, was, was, you know, ordered. Uh, so... It, you know, between that and Nintendo's request to to license it before it became a final product, uh, we decided that it was better to do that. Now, the license process is is a, a difficult one and a long one um, for the most part, and we have to be have to make a very very uh, good product for that to happen. Um, so that's one of the main reasons why it hasn't resurfaced. And also, we spent the last year um, working on um, improvements that we haven't uh, revealed yet. Um, 
by, by we haven't, I mean, Panda hasn't revealed yet, but as far as I know, <clears throat> as far as I know, Panda no longer, um, I don't think can continue hardware anymore. So the controller uh, through Panda probably won't, uh, won't, won't quite happen. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Thank you, Alan. Yeah. Well, that's going to be it for us for the night, folks. Alan, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. Um, and uh, for everybody listening, we will be back on Wednesday with another interview. So stay tuned to the Overcome Twitter account. Thank you all. Thank you all very much. Thanks for watching Visionaries on YouTube. For more content, please subscribe to the Overcome channel.